Good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Horner and I'm the Director of Education at Emory Michael C. Carlos Museum. And I'd just like to begin by thanking all of you who have joined us for so many of the Zoom programs held in conjunction with the exhibition, Wondrous Worlds, Art and Islam Through Time and Place. The exhibition, um, today's program marks the last of our programs in conjunction with this exhibition. And it's just been such a pleasure to um, have you all here and to be involved in conversation with you about this exhibition. Um, I so appreciate your support. The exhibition is open through May 9th and the Carlos is open to the public. Uh, you can go to carlos.emory.edu to make a reservation. We are open at limited capacity to ensure your safety. Um, so please do come before it closes on May 9th. And today we are delighted um, to have one of our In This Moment programs and delighted to welcome Brittany Landorf. Brittany is a third year doctoral student in the Graduate Division of Religion here at Emory. Her work explores questions of Islam, gender, and sexuality in North Africa. Before coming to Emory, she earned a master's in theological studies from Harvard Divinity School and completed a Fulbright English teaching fellowship in Turkey. Her research in North Africa began as an undergraduate at McAllister College, studying abroad in, in Morocco and writing about the continued reverberations of the 2011 Arab Spring protests in contemporary Moroccan feminist movements. Here at Emory, Brittany's doctoral research examines the co-constitutive nature of gender and religion, with a specific focus on masculinities in North African mysticism. This fall, she is thrilled to be traveling back to Morocco, fingers crossed, <laughs> where she will conduct research on the gendered scripts of spiritual training and Moroccan, Moroccan Sufi orders supported by a Fulbright research grant. And today she is here to talk about um, the work of Lala Asadi, whose beautiful photograph, Harem One, opens the Wondrous Worlds exhibition. So Brittany, thank you so much for being with us um, as we celebrate this exhibition and your scholarship and the end of our programming. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for having me and, um, and thank you, Elizabeth, for that introduction. I'm thrilled to be here today speaking about an artist, Lala Asadi, who I have followed for the past 10 years. Um, and who is featured as a prominent artwork in the Carlos Museum's um, Wondrous World series. Curiously, while Lala Asadi's painting, Harem One, is the first installation that one sees in the exhibit, Wondrous Worlds, Art and Islam Through Time and Place, this event marks both the closure of the exhibit and the end of the semester. In part, it was chosen as the final event due to the challenges of navigating busy schedules, to which I am very grateful for Elizabeth's help. Um, oops, sorry, and flexibility. However, the photo's place as a threshold or a boundary in both the physical space of the museum and within time, demarcating the end of its stay at Emory gestures to some of the key elements of Lala Asadi's work, which can be evinced within Harem One, namely the relationship and displacement of space, time, and the female body. The tripartite structure of the photo, which can be seen here, produces a certain disorientation and uncertainty within the viewer. When you first enter the exhibit hall, or if viewing it for the first time here in disembodied virtual Zoom space, the initial experience is one of distance. While the female subject is situated in the center panel, she also fades into the background, surrounded and overwhelmed by a door frame that emphasizes the distance between her and the viewer. The spatial sense of difference is further accentuated by the exaggerated juxtaposition of the larger courtyard with the smaller room wherein the woman is reclining. The columns on the right and left panels seem to not only frame the center portrait, 
but to also encircle or limit the woman within. The metaphorical and physical thresholds and play of space are intensified in the interrelationship and fusion of the women's body with her surroundings. Her traditional dress or kaftan, shoes, um, or, which are on the ground, the curtains and the furniture draw on and replicate the patterns and colors of the floor, wall, and ceiling tiles. The parts of her body not covered by the plays of blues, greens, and whites and in, are inscribed with calligraphic Arabic script, which as Sadie had applied herself using the medium of henna. The woman thus appears simultaneously as a flattened image, immobile, as well as a mirage, fading in and out of focus. Harem One and its exploration of spatial, temporal, and embodied thresholds illuminates a key aspect of Lala Asadi's multimedia photography, as the writer has written, reflecting on her own work. And I quote, in my photography, I explore this space, that is the space of Islamic culture, whether mental or physical, and interrogate its role in making gender identity while engaging with centuries of cultural heritage and artistic practices, end quote. Lala Asadi depicted here, um, her interest in the convergence of multiple, ge multiple geographies, geographies and imaginaries draws from her own personal experience. Born in 1956 in a small city 20 kilometers to the south and west of Marrakesh, which is located in the south of Morocco. She was one of 11 children. Her father, a small city leader with sharif and authority, that is authority descended from the prophet Muhammad, had four wives. She grew up in what she has termed a traditional harem or separated domestic female space. At the age of 16, she went to Paris where she studied art history. She returned to Morocco when she was 20, marrying a Saudi man and moving to Saudi Arabia for the next 13 years, where she gave birth and raised two children, a boy and a girl. It was not until the age of 34, when her children were grown, that she returned to her studies. Enrolling in the School of the Museum of Fine Arts and Tufts University's MFA program in Boston. She received her MFA there in 1996. She now lives between New York and Marrakesh, staging most of her work, including Harem One, in the city of Marrakesh. While trained as a painter, Asadi's work largely focuses on multimedia installations and photography. In the last two decades, her work has gained international prominence for her photographs of Moroccan women covered in Arabic calligraphy written with henna. Her most prominent exhibits include Converging Territories in 2005, which marked the debut of her particular style of inscribing the bodies of those women close to her with henna and Arabic calligraphy. Her next exhibit in 2008, um, Le Femme du Maroc or The Women of Morocco, directly draws on and subverts fantasies of Arab women found in the paintings of French 19th century Orientalist painters, in particular Delacroix's painting entitled The Woman of Algeria. Harem One, which is the subject of discussion of this talk, is the first image of her third series, Harem, and its counterpart, Harem Revisited, shown in 2010 and 2012 respectively. These photos, even more than her previous ones, emphasize the relationship between traditional Moroccan architecture as found in the palaces or riads of the elite in Marrakesh with the everyday lives of Moroccan women. Finally, her most recent exhibit, Bullets and Bullets Revisited in 2012, marks a shift in her work and a more direct engagement with the violent, imperial, and material legacies of colonialism and Orientalism. Depicted in the bottom left corner of the screen, the woman lying on her back 
gazing at the screen is not only covered in Aesthetes' traditional calligraphic henna script, but is also covered with cloth embedded with bullets that have been painted gold. The bullets are not only sewn into the model's clothing, but are also installed in the walls, bed, and floor. Bullets and Bullets Revisited makes explicit Asadi's exploration and critique of the material and embodied consequences wrought by colonial legacies and Orientalist depictions found in her earlier work. These photographic series also illustrate three central elements of Asadi's photography, namely that of the veil, the odalesque, and the harem. In the photo Harem 16, which provides a closer image of the female subject in Harem 1, we can see two of these elements very clearly, the odalesque and the harem at play. The physical veil, which some of you may know as a hijab, is absent. The author's omission of the veil in this photo and in many of the photos of this series subverts and critiques earlier Western in European depictions of Arab and Muslim women um, who are veiled in the harems or half veiled. As a Saidi who spent most of her childhood raised in a harem, a traditional harem with her mother and siblings and who herself does not veil would know, women do not wear a veil in the private home space nor in front of women or other family members. It would be quite foolish. However, although the physical veil is absent in this photo, its metaphorical presence is marked and explored through the visual threshold, the doorways, and the calligraphic writing inscribed on the woman's body. Thus, even when ostensibly omitted or unseen, these three elements, the veil, the odalesque, and the harem, continue to shape and structure her photos. Before continuing to discuss in more depth the figure of the odalesque in the space of the harem, it is important to first unpack what I mean when I use the term orientalist and orientalism, as well as how it features within a Sadie's photography. Orientalism is quite a broad term, one that at times may feel too wide or unwieldy, losing its valence capturing as it does both stereotypical representations and tropes, relations of power, as well as an academic discipline of study, among other things. As a scholar of Islam and Islamic mysticism or Sufism, the origins of my own academic discipline are within what was called and is still called in some places, Oriental studies or Orientalism. However, for the purpose of this presentation and for understanding how a Sadie herself deals with the term, we will use this definition drawn from the work of Edward Said, a scholar of postcolonial studies who first theorized the term Orientalism. Orientalism is, and I quote, the representation of the Orient, especially the Middle East, in Western academic writing, art, or literature. Specifically, this representation is perceived as stereotyped or exoticizing, and therefore embodying a colonialistic and imperialistic attitude." End quote. Thus, Orientalism is a system of power relations produced within and by the West that relies on imaginary or fantastical representations and tropes of Oriental people and places particularly of women. Think, for example, Jasmine in the Disney movie Aladdin. However, you may still be wondering, what is the Orient? Where is it located? Who is considered to be Oriental? Is the Orient even a term that we should be using anymore? The answer is probably no. Um, but most recently, I was applying to a federal grant funded by the Department of Education to conduct research in Morocco. While many things about this grant were confusing, the most perplexing was that they asked us to place our country within a physical region of the world. Those regions were Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, South America, 
and the Near East. I was quite confused as um, the former categories here were continents and I was not aware that the Near East was a continent. I found myself wondering, was Morocco in the Near East or in Africa? Geographically, it is very clearly in Africa, marking the northernmost western corner of the continent. I spent many hours and days puzzling over this question, emailing school officials and government granting officers. Finally, I received the answer. According to the US Department of State, Morocco resides in the Near East, which for the American government at least, seems to de demarcate the lands ranging from Morocco to Iran, a space we might now also think of as the Middle East. The Orient is thus both an imaginary geography of Arabness and Muslimness, depicted in art, literature, and popular culture, as well as a place that carries real material and geopolitical consequences. Isaidi uses Orientalism, particularly 19th century Orientalist paintings, as shown here, as a point of departure in her own work. However, her relationship with Orientalism is a complicated one. While she appreciates the beauty of the pieces, she cringes at the ways that they misrepresent the everyday life of Arab and Muslim women, um, people and the ways that they degrade the position of women. Her choice to use, appropriate and subvert Orientalist paintings and trope in her own work came about after a moment she had early on when studying art in the United States. At the time, she had been in the studio working on a painting deconstructing the work of a French Orientalist artist, and her teacher walked over to her. Observing her work over her shoulder, the teacher remarked that she had always thought that the fantastical sexualized depictions of women in harems was real life. Or as a friend recently remarked to me when I explained this presentation in um, the photo that I was talking about, they had thought that harem always meant brothel. It had never occurred to them that the harem perhaps meant um, something other than that. It is then in that moment when a Sadie decided to make deconstructing works such as that of the painting shown here, Le Grand Odalisque, which was painted by the French Orientalist, Jean-Auguste Dominique Ong, the focus of her work. And one of the things, if I could just pause on this photo to draw your attention to, um, and this is something that Asadi herself quite deals with, which is both the beauty and the grotesqueness of these Oriental paintings. The woman's body in this image, not only is it sort of like although I guess she's wearing a headdress, but not only is it denuded, bared, laid um, open for the Western European eye, but it's also elongated, almost grotesque in its disproportionness. Um, this is something that Asadi would, said, would say um, when she reflects on those paintings, both draws her in and disgusts her. There's this mutual pull and push back um, that these paintings produce. Much of her earlier work in converging territories in the woman of Morocco restages canonical paintings to expose the voyeuristic tradition of Orientalism and of the Orientalist as voyeur, peering in and uncovering the Muslim. I go back again to this painting, right? We see um, the image both of the like the lushness of the harem, but as well as the naked woman within. So the sense of the French painter imagining this image, not seeing in real life, but imagining it and constructing it as if it was real, almost pornographic, as Fatima Mernisi would say. So she deconstructs this tradition of voyeur, of the peering in and uncumbering. In this photo, which Lala Asadi also titles La Grande Odalisque, Asadi plays with citationality and iteration, staging her model in the exact same pose of the previous painting, 
yet covering her model with cloth and her own autobiography, as well as poems and other critiques of um, other critiques that she inscribes within the writing using the medium of henna. The woman's feet, if you notice, appear stained, almost bruised or torn from work. This signifies that she is not only um, a woman living purely for pleasure for the Western male fantasy, but rather works, performing household duties, visiting the market, etc. Isadi writes of this painting, and I quote, my work seeks to destabilize conventional orientalist expectations. And one of the ways that I do this is by empowering the slave or the servant. In my paintings, for instance, the servant becomes the guardian of the domestic space. She is the one who is richly garbed and who is gazing directly at the viewer, gazing back, disrupting the orientalist tradition. The servant in some of my paintings, for instance, is no longer the passive creature, but the real Arab woman." End quote. The harem, as both a site of Orientalist fantasy and as the private domain of women in Moroccan culture, is the third main feature which frames and shapes Isadi's photography, both physically and metaphorically. Simply defined, the harem is the separate private part of a house reserved for the women of the household an access to which is prohibited to all family members and female servants. However, within the realm of Orientalist painters, such as Delacroix and Ung, the harem is a fantasy space, a private or secluded location, a room characterized by luxury or devoted to pleasure, or a place frequented by women. Esedi draws on both of these meanings of harem, as well as a third one, articulated by the late Moroccan scholar and feminist Fatima Mernisi, who described the harem in her memoir, Dreams of Trespass, as, and I quote, a threshold or a frontier. The photo in this slide comes from Mernisi's own memoir, which depicts her memories growing up in a harem in the 1940s and 50s in Northern Morocco. As a metaphorical and physical threshold or frontier, the harem in Harem 1 depicts Isadi's understanding of converging territories, both of Western and Eastern, of public and private, and of masculine and feminine. These binary terms, however, do not signify separate entities in Isadi's life, um, in Isadi's work. Rather, they are constitutive of each other, entangled and interrelated within the physical space of the harem. She writes in her essay, Disrupting the Odalisque, and I quote, in a sense, my work is haunted by space, actual and metaphorical, remembered and constructed. My photographs grew out of the need I felt to document actual spaces especially the space of my childhood. Thus for a Sadie, physical, threshold physical thresholds define cultural ones. Hidden hierarchies depict patterns of habitation. We can see this convergence of space and overlapping territories and imaginaries of gender clearly in Harem 1. Again, in this photo, the converging territories of space and gender and the use of the female body act as a double critique, implicating both Orientalist fantasies, which, which sexualize and denude women, and Arab cultures, which delimits them. Asadi constrains the women within the space of the harem, observing in her photos that she is, and I quote, confining them that is, the women, to their proper place, a place bounded by walls and controlled by men, end quote. In doing so, the Moroccan scholar of comparative literature, who coincidentally also received her PhD, PhD from Emory University, Naima Hashad writes, 
and I quote, the quasi fusion of the female bodies with their surroundings and interior spaces um, inscribes physical and social cultural boundaries that frame Moroccan women's socialization and highlights the historical use of space to perpetuate patriarchal, societal, and gender norms, end quote. Asadi's meticulous and laborious use of Arabic calligraphy and henna further emphasized the inscription of the female body within and with its surroundings, embodying the double critique of converging patriarchies. Asadi, who is depicted here, working on, I believe this was for Bullets Revisited, but working for a project, on, or working on her photography for Bullets Revisited, uses um, multimedia performances. Her work consists of painting, photography, calligraphy, and henna application. They involve an elaborate staging process with a Sadie designing and sewing the clothing the female subjects wear. Often traditional Moroccan dress, such as the kaftan, to accentuate and flow into the background architecture. In addition to extensive preparatory work completed both in her studio in New York and on site in Marrakesh, the photographs themselves might take as long as nine to 10 hours of painstaking work to stage as a Sadie applies the henna herself on the bodies of her female subjects. A Sadie's use of henna as calligraphy is pointed. Henna as a domestic feminine art has traditionally been reserved for women and marks important moments within a woman's life in Morocco. She observes how it is first applied when a girl attains puberty to mark her passage into womanhood. When she is a bride, it is thought to enhance her charms for her husband. Finally, it is used to celebrate fertility. When she has her first child, especially when the first child, firstborn is male. In contrast, Arabic calligraphy has been commonly perceived as a high art, a masculine art. By interweaving henna, a feminine art, and calligraphy, a masculine text, Isadi exposes the contradictions between male, female hierarchies and private and public spaces, dissolving them. Moreover, and perhaps more importantly, in inscribing the female body within her own autobiographical experiences of child, growing up in Morocco, living as a married woman in Saudi Arabia, and navigating her life in the US and France, Isadi further unravels the complexities of Moroccan women's identities, dislocating the idea of a singular Moroccan and or a Muslim woman's experience. And the two photos here, which I think in particular Bullets Revisited can show us, um, you can see how the, the calligraphy is not only on the dress, but right covering the feet and the arms and the face. Um, you can also see this to a lesser extent. It's a little bit occluded in Harem 16. Isidi's photos thus generate and inculcate in the viewer a sense of disorientation and dislocation. While the women in Harem One shown here, um, while the women in Harem One shown here on the right side of the screen reverses the voyeuristic orientalist masculinist gaze, gazing directly back into the eyes of the viewer, she is nonetheless also occluded and enshrouded, inscribed with the Sadie's writing and fused with the architectural background. The famed Moroccan scholar Fatima Mernisi, reflecting on this lingering feeling of disorientation produced by the dizzying calligraphic inscription on the bodies, cloth, walls, and floors of Asadi's work, writes um, after attending Converging Territories in Marrakesh in 2005. And I quote, uncertainty is the only certain feeling you are left with. Because Lala teaches what Umberto Eco, 
the Italian writer calls the art of lingering. You often get lost in Lala Asadi's images because insecurity and uncertainty are the recurring themes her women spell out if you invest the effort to decode their messages, end quote. The uncertainty and ambiguity produced by her visual embodied double critique of both Western and Moroccan patriarchies connects her work to that of post-colonial scholars, artists, and writers, such as that of the Iranian-American multimedia artist Shireen Nishat, as well as speaks to and draws on a rich history of gender critique in Morocco. There is much to say about the politics of gender critique in Morocco, which one could claim extends as far back as the conception of the country in the seventh and eighth centuries. More recently, however, there have been quite significant gains in prominent feminist movements and solidarity building at work, beginning with the 2004 reforms to the Islamic family law concerning matters of divorce, inheritance, and marriage, and with the 2011 reforms to the Constitution following the 20th of February movement protests. In 2016, women were further granted more authority within religious spaces through the foundation of a spiritual training program for women to act as spiritual guides. Nonetheless, as this photo depicts, um, which this photo is taken in 2014 from a protest march, gender critique and protest continue to be a feature of Moroccan public and private life, um, particularly as women are focusing on issues of sexual harassment in the country. Um, most recently, actually, I think in the past year, the Me Too movement has been particularly prolific both online and in the streets. Lala Asadi's work thus, in many ways, is both a product of this rich critique as well as contributes to further highlighting the efforts and praxis of Moroccan women, whether as secular feminists or Islamic feminists or everything in between, to affect change the social, cultural, political, and religious lives of women. In particular, Isadi's work has been compared to and championed by the famed late feminist Fatima Mernisi, who is Moroccan, and the Egyptian Nawal Sadawi, who is Egyptian, or who is um, Egyptian. Both women represent an early generation of Arab feminist thinkers whose nuanced critique of Western and Arab cultures was deeply influential for Isadi. In particular, Mernisi, who I've previously mentioned is well known for her feminist reinterpretation of classical Islam Islamic scripture. Her memoir, whose cover is depicted here, influenced and reverberates with Asadi's own life experience of being raised in a harem. Murnisi, who recently passed away, wrote the introduction for one of Asadi's photo essays, referring to her in it as a digital, a digital Shahrazad, referencing the famed female storyteller and main character in the A Thousand and One Nights stories, whose stories, tales, and wiles saved her life, that of her families, and reformed a king. Yet, despite the nuanced critique Lala Asadi puts forth in her work, its ambiguity and uncertainty and the complexity she attempts to articulate, importantly, her critique of the mutual converging territories of patriarchies, she is often asked to speak specifically for and about the Muslim women, participating in the discourse of white savior and Muslim womanhood, which anthropologist Laila Abulugod has famously problematized in her book and article do Muslim women need saving? In almost every interview she gives, Isadi is asked about what her photos say about the role, freedom, independence, and agency of Muslim women in society today. Or in other words, how do her photos speak back to the repression of Muslim women by Muslim men? 
Her response to these questions is always, and I quote, I presume to speak, I cannot presume, I cannot presume to speak for Arab women and my work cannot be reduced to an Orientalist discourse, end quote. The continued framing of Asidi's work as one which only speaks to the critique of Muslim Arab patriarchy and not as also a decolonial critique of Orientalism and continued Western imperialism and patriarchy raises the question posed by Moroccan scholar of comparative literature, Naima Hashad, and I quote, is it possible to separate subversion from reiteration? That is to say, in what ways does the Sadie's artwork or the marketing of her artwork at times further contribute to sustaining Orientalist narratives? And what are the material and geopolitical implications of the continued afterlives of Orientalism? As the most recent burqa ban in France indicates, a protest of which is depicted here, or the discourse around what will happen to Afghan women with the removal of troops from Afghanistan illustrate, is, illustrates, Western viewers, specifically politicians, continue to per portray Muslim women as victims, victims in need of saving. For France, this means that once again, much like the 19th century Orientalist painters, women are being asked to strip, denude, and bear themselves. Freedom and agency in this discourse is articulated primarily through, on, and about the female body. Isadi openly grapples with this question and the afterlives and continued reverberations of neo and post of neo Orientalism in her work, as well as their implications for the lives of women throughout the Islamicate Muslim world. To this end, um, and in thinking about the problematic of representation, I want to close with her own words, letting Asadi speak um, for herself. In a world in which many Orientalist tropes continue to dominate contemporary depictions in films and popular media, and often set the terms for political analysis, my work aims to provide viewers with an understanding of the history of these visuals and the tools to critically arrange the narratives they support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brittany, for sharing um, your perspectives and, and helping us to understand this. Um, very complex artwork. I love that you ended with her words and I hope that everybody will take a moment to put questions into the Q&A. Um, and while you're doing that, I will ask my own question. You and I touched on this the other day when we were talking. When you, when you, her works are clearly photographs. And yet when, she, when you quote her and she talks about them, she talk, she refers to them as paintings. And I'm just wondering what you think of that. Um, what does that, it's definitely um, a blurring of art forms, and I wonder what that is. Yeah, I think she would think of her work as more performance art almost, not so much paintings. I think painting is a part of it in the sense of um, how she paints sort of the cloth and, and uses henna and calligraphy. Um, but I think when all of the things that I've read of her work, she almost thinks of herself more as an installation artist, like the foot. The photo which you see is the final production, uh -huh. um, but it isn't, it's just like the tip of the iceberg of everything that goes into it. And so much is right, the sort of like nine, 10, 11 hours that she spends um, sort of like, not even like, you know, kind of like writing the, the calligraphy on women's bodies, positioning them, speaking with them, all sorts of things like that. 
Um, and I think that that was what I hadn't actually realized that before I started preparing for this presentation. I've seen her work for years, but I never thought about all that goes into it. Um, so. Well, and there's a related question. We have several questions I'm, I'm, and I'm not doing them quite in order, but I'll get to them. Um, somebody's asked, is there a meaning that the Kodak border is not cropped out? Um, um, so the, the border that is not cropped up out? At the top left, you can see it says Kodak. Yeah, so. And, and the top right as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm not super sure, honestly. I, I do notice that all of her photos are like that. And I think part of it is the, um, so if you look at all of her work, they're all sort of show cat. Um, they have the same sort of little like black um, and then the Kodak yeah. on the top. And I think part of that is also the idea of trying to, um, giving the sense of it being like an image that was captured. Um, and that is flat in a certain extent, but again, is like is the final product of this very like labor laborious work. And related to that, I had someone ask me the same question in a in person tour this morning in the Carlos, that the the left and the right panels seem to be the same image but flipped, so that Kodak is written left to right. Mm -hmm. And so it's not actually one space, but it's, it, it, is it in fact a flipped image? And then Scott Kugel has a somewhat related question um, when he says, in the three-part photo, the perspective lines do not seem to harmonize. And is that on purpose? And what is the intent? So I think it, it actually, and I've also, so I've been to this palace before and right, we were discussing this. So this is um, the photo in that Harem One is, is taken in is a palace in, in Marrakesh, um, which is now open to the public. Well, I guess not currently open, but you can visit in non-COVID times. And I was racking my brains to try to figure out where this was taken because I don't remember seeing um, an image. I don't, I don't remember seeing a courtyard with these, like the two columns as they're positioned facing each other. And I think it actually may be a flipped image. Um, and mostly, I don't think it's supposed to harmonize so much as to like give the sense of enclosing in. Mm -hmm. So the, the harmony is perhaps less important than this feeling of sort of being enclosed um, and sort of delimited and the idea of a threshold. Thank you. And Elizabeth Paston says, thank you. And says she, I would like to draw you out on the inscriptions that cover the body in Haram One, which in this work of Asadis are not visible unless you know to look for them or have seen other works of hers where the inscriptions are more prominent, which has to do with what you said earlier about how she's there, but she's at a distance. Yes. Um, sorry, what was the question with the She just wants to, she wants you to comment about the fact that the inscriptions are there, um, but they're not as obvious as in some of the earlier or later works. Yeah, and I, later think, works. I think that if you saw this photo within all of the series that it's a part of, um, so even in, I can maybe go back to, um, Harem 16, where you can see it a little bit more, right? This is the same image as the central panel of Harem 1. Um, and within it, you can see it a little bit more. But part of that is I think the work of, of this series was to almost focus a little bit more on the relationship of the, sort of the body to the architecture. So there was a lot more, um, if you compare Bullets Revisited and maybe Harem 16 here, you can see that the patterns right on the kaftan itself. Um, and I believe that right, she made um, also the bed. So all of these things were things that she produced herself. And there was a little bit more intentionality in bringing in Moroccan architecture um within the painting and then the calligraphy is there but perhaps not as important as these other aspects robert joy asks um the depiction of the haram in the photo is one of luxury beautiful and presumably very expensive spacious architecture and decor um do middle class and working women also grow up in harems 
No, that's an amazing, well, so it's, it's complicated, but that's an amazing um, question. And one of the things too, which I um, regret if I didn't emphasize, right, this idea, so the harem um, that Lala Asadi, Fatima Mernisi, and other women experienced, both kind of like in a particular time and place, um, not really practiced at all anymore, but also very elite. Um, so even right this this palace, which I believe one of the reasons that um, Lola picked it was that her father spent some time here in his childhood. Um, so this was not even where, where she grew up with, but it's opulent, it's beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful buildings that I've seen in Morocco, but not by any means sort of the standard. Um, and the other aspects of a harem sort of like, it was, it was a privilege in sort of an elite thing to be participating in one. Lower and middle-class women, they had to, they had to and continue to leave their houses um, for work, you know, to do errands, to do all sorts of things. So it's very much a social and economic divide between them. There are several comments in the, the Q&A in the chat um, thanking you for a wonderful presentation, a uh, question as to whether or not you will publish this excellent essay, um, and somebody asking to find out more about you because you've done such a wonderful job sharing how you got interested in North African studies. Mm -hmm. Um, so in terms of, I didn't think about um, publishing it, but I guess I certainly, I certainly could. Um, and so my, my advisor is actually here. He asked a question. So I did this kind of, um, I should be working in my prospectus, um, but I spent a lot of time on this in the last two weeks. So I'm, I'm sorry, Scott. Um, but I, I did become quite interested in, and I think I will either in a blog form or some other aspect share it. Um, in terms of North African studies, it kind of, I kind of stumbled into it, I want to say. Nothing, I could give a very linear narrative story of how it happened, but um, I'm really just a girl from Wisconsin who went to a liberal arts school that was very liberal and thought that I wanted to be a human rights lawyer when I was 18. And so I started learning Arabic and studied abroad in Morocco. And along that way, I grew increasingly critical of human rights discourse, um, and in particular, the way it kind of works within the US. Um, so increasingly disenchanted with that, but also very interested in how people are living out their lives in gendered and religious ways. And so the study abroad in Morocco was really important for that, um, not just the experience and like just really speaking, speaking to people, but also I studied with excellent scholars of Moroccan feminism who continue to be sort of thought partners um, and, and scholars who I do work with today. So it was kind of sort of like a stumbling along path that has taken me here. Well, we are so fortunate um, the Carlos Museum at Emory to be able to draw on the rich resources of the university. Um, I'm forever grateful to all of the faculty members at Emory um, who helped consult on the programming for this exhibition, who gave programs with ex this exhibition, who introduced me to wonderful graduate students like Brittany to share their scholarship. Um, They've all been incredibly generous and I want to thank all of the speakers in this series and also our collaborators and sponsors who have made it all possible. The um, E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, Carol Johnson, the Ismali Council for the Southeastern United States, Georgia Humanities, the Decatur Book Festival, um, and all the people that I've had the privilege of working with um, on this beautiful exhibition and the programming. So Brittany, thank you. And thank all of you who have joined us um, over these last months. And again, do try to get in and see the exhibition before it closes on May 9th. It is really beautiful. And um, thank you very much for being with us today. Yeah. Thank you everyone for joining. Bye-bye. Have a great weekend. <laughs>